obviously we can't go over the whole book because it's like 900 pages long. Is there anything... That, that's not true. It's 1,200 pages long. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, you got like 300 pages of notes in here. <laughs> so if I didn't... Okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I, uh, and I, I've been listening. This isn't the first conversation you obviously had about the book. Is there any topic that you've hoped that somebody asked that they I, haven't I, yet? I'd just like to begin with a statement that I saw recently from Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, you know who Jeffrey Sachs is. He was the uh, the man that uh, basically uh, orchestrated the looting of Russia uh, as a agent of Wall Street. He what, was, sat- was he in this book? <clears throat> no. Okay. But I, I mention this because, no, uh, is the looting of Russia in that book? I, I don't think so. I but anyway. I don't think so, yeah. They, but uh, he stood at Yeltsin's hand when they basically privatized the, the entire country. Uh, and he said recently that he that everything he did was wrong and it was based on an economics that made no sense. Ooh. And he got a, a PhD in economics and it was totally worthless. And he's going back to the sources and the source he mentioned was Aristotle. Well, good luck, Jeff. Good luck uh, trying to reinvent the wheel here because uh, – Someone more capable than you has already done it, and that's Heinrich Pesch, and he's the basis of that book that I wrote. Uh, and uh, one of the main reasons I wrote Baron Metal was to make his thought accessible to uh, the English-speaking world. That's excellent. And in fact, I think normally I do, I do an intro before we started, but I think that's a good place to start. I'll do the uh, intro ex post facto here. <laughs> which is essentially this is Dylan Moore with I Read a TV. Obviously, we have Dr. E. Michael Jones on the show. Uh, we are here to talk about his book, Barren Metal. Let me, get the, let me get the subtitle here, right? A History of Capitalism as the Conflict Between Labor and, and Usury. Dr. Jones is the editor over at Culture Wars magazine and author of very big books like this. Uh, and my first question, Dr. Jones, I got to be honest. How many hours a day do you spend writing? Eight hours a day. I never, I never go for more than eight hours a day. Is it, do you take weekends off? I take uh, week. No, I work especially hard on Saturday because um, Saint John Capistrano said we should show the Jews that we don't really follow their holidays anymore. So I work especially hard on Saturday. Uh, sometimes. More than others. No, I, I lead a very normal, regulated life uh, and do not work after generally five o'clock in the afternoon, ever. I but mean, there are exceptions, start? but generally I don't. I, I start I at nine o'clock in the morning okay. and I work till five o'clock in the afternoon. So normal 40 out, maybe 40, 48 hour work week since I work on Saturday. And I guess I'm already started getting off track here, but now I'm interested. How do you, what's your secret to staying focused? mentally i mean obviously this is a huge mental thing a, a, a huge mental exercise how do you stay focused eight hours a day mentally on something like writing on and it's not like you're writing fiction here <laughs> you're not stephen king just barfing whatever comes out of your head right i mean this is well-researched stuff well that's the key i i think that the biggest thing that helped me uh was getting fired from a pro- job i had as a professor Mm-hmm. Uh, I started off as an academic and then I started a magazine and with the magazine, I was basically writing articles every month. And at a certain point, I realized that those articles could become chapters in a book. Mm. And so it allowed me to break it down into manageable segments. Uh, the first example was Degenerate Moderns, uh, which is, was basically a series of articles that appeared in, uh, it was called Fidelity then, and then it became Culture Wars. But the idea that uh, the the life, the moral life is important to the intellectual life was the idea that guided me throughout that. And it, it began when I started reading biographies of the people that I studied when I was an undergraduate in college, like Jean-Paul Sartre. I read a biography of him. Uh, and that allowed, I never wrote a, a chapter on him, but it allowed me to understand what I had been doing in a way that was not possible before in a way that it was simply led to confusion. I was mm. I was in uh, the university at the tail end of existentialism. 
So everybody was reading people like Jean-Paul uh, Sartre and Albert Camus. It was still, it was kind of like a 50s phenomenon in France, but when I was in uh, the university in the 60s in Philadelphia and people still studied them, but you did it in a, a, a kind of ahistorical fashion because philosophy was not history. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think it's an artificial distinction. And I think that the, and also uh, I was uh, taught to began my career as a literary critic under the new criticism, which said, you just have to focus on the work. The biography is irrelevant. Well, no, that's not the case at all. Because I yeah. began to see the bio biography is very relevant, especially if what you're doing is projecting your own values onto the to the subject, you know? So you can either conform the your desires to the truth or the truth to your desires. If you conform the truth to your desires, your desires are the most important thing that I need to know. And I need I get to know that by reading a decent biography. That's how I got started. Yeah, the, the biography of Karl Marx is what's coming to my mind on that, where, you know, he, he talks about all this exploitation of the worker and, and, and such things. And from my understanding, he never set foot in a factory during the Industrial Revolution, and he never really had a job. And he, you know, he got his um, housekeeper pregnant and kicked her out on the street. I mean, like... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, th I think it's even more obvious with Engels. Yeah. Engels, Engels had this fascination. His father owned a factory and he had this fascination with uh, working uh, girls who were working in the factory and uh, was a great sexual exploiter of those girls. Uh, uh, Irish girl that he met in, uh, in England and uh, wrote this manifesto about women's liberation based on his own uh, disordered lust and exploit he was literally right. so exploiting. If, if women are literally uh, liberated i get laid more is basically that's his. right that, yeah, that yeah. Was, he was one of the first guys <laughs> who understood the way that worked so it, it really helped to understand uh, somebody like angles it helps to understand just about anybody uh it's important it's important because the good the true and the beautiful are all transcendentals and they're all related mm -hmm. well I, I think that's a good place to start to start because obviously in in your book bear and metal here there's a lot of biographically relevant information uh and i, I think that's a good mindset to to jump into this from and before we we really dive into it i think it'd be a good idea because in i mean let me read this title again yeah bear and metal a history of capitalism as a conflict between labor and usury L please define just so we're all on the same page capitalism labor and usury yeah, capitalism is state-sponsored usury. How's that for bringing the thing together? That's uh, that's the the definition that I got from Pesh. Uh, the other thing is capitalism is the systematic appropriation of all surplus value. Mm -hmm. Surplus value means if you have a bushel of wheat that has a certain value, if you turn that into a a, a bag of flour, you've increased the value. Mm -hmm. Because it's closer, and then you turn that flour into a loaf of bread, you've increased the power, the value even more. That step of increased value along the way is called surplus value, and that is purely labor. That's all you're adding to that material. Okay, you're adding labor, and that brings us to the next point, which is that labor is the source of all value. These are fundamental principles that you have to understand if you want to do serious economics. Well, and then uh, I want to uh, split a hair here because the word capitalism, I mean, is so emotionally loaded. Like, it, I, I feel like we have to address it just to just to get past people's shields, because, I mean, um, if, if we take the, uh, the say, the communist version of it, we could say, OK, it's it's the exploitation of the worker. If you take the libertarian version of it, it's, hey, uh uh, free, you know, being freedom. able to trade, it's yeah, freedom. trade without coercion, right? Right. Or right. I mean, maybe we even take the Ter Carol Quigley definition of it, which is just a hey, pursuit of profit within a price structure, right? I, I, I want, I want it to be clear when we're having this conversation that when we're saying capitalism, we're using your definition, which, as you just pointed out, is state-sponsored usury. State-sponsored usury. I think it's the best definition. Everything else is ideological, either ideologies of the left or I, which demonize it, or ideologic, ideologic ideologies of the right which valorize it. But uh, that's you have to break out of that that dialectic because otherwise you're not going to understand it. And the way you break out of that is by being understanding that uh, it's 
uh, economics is a branch of moral philosophy, and that means it's philosophy. You have to have some type of philosophical understanding of principles, specifically uh, the, the uh, practical reason, which is how you achieve the good. That is the matrix out of which you can have a fruitful understanding of uh, what economics is. That is not what it is now. And that's not what Jeffrey Sachs learned when he went to uh, uh, to get a PhD in economics. I want to jump uh, there. We still have one more definition. Usury. Usury. Okay. Uh, compound interest. A us a usury in general means the fundamental reality of economic life is two people coming together, one with money and the other with the good. Uh, even the good may be his own labor. And there's trying to work out some type of agreement where they can exchange money for some other good. In this situation, the stronger will always be tempted to take advantage of the weaker. That's mm -hmm. why it's a, mor a moral issue. And you have to bring economics is coming to an understanding of the balance that has to be achieved between those two parties. So the classic example of the stronger taking advantage of the weaker would be the employer taking care, uh, taking advantage of the employee because the employer holds the cards and there are lots of employees out there and he can just kick them out. That was, that was the battle uh, that for basically I'd say a hundred years uh, beginning with what, what do you want to begin it with the uh, communist manifesto in 1848 mm -hmm. where the factory system had come into existence and there was ruthless exploitation of the worker ruthless exploitation as comes about with new technologies there's always going to be an exploitation whenever there's a new technology we're going through it right now with the internet and uh, all of that type of stuff where it is it, the powerful seize control of the internet and they use it as a way to to enrich themselves and impoverish everyone else that's what the factory system did and that's why at that point you needed to bring this moral understanding to the table the first man who did it in a serious fashion in now I, look, look you know the book it goes all the way back to the italian middle ages no you st you started in rome if i remember correctly <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm saying uh, for this particular system and yeah. obviously there's a whole bunch of chapters on the Medici, and they were the beginning of the factory system. The production of cloth in Florence was the mm -hmm. beginning of the factory system. But by the 19th century, uh, it had become so widespread and so pressing that the church finally got involved when Bishop Kebel, Bishop von Kettler of uh, Mainz wrote uh, a book called uh, Christentum und die Arbeiterfrage, Christianity and the Worker Question, where he tried to situate this in a Christian context, uh, that book came out the same year that Das Kapital came out. Mm -hmm. And so you had this battle now, in a sense, for the German mind, because this was a German, it was basically Germany and England at this point, two countries battling it out to see who's going to be the most, who's going to rule the world and who's going to have the most powerful economic system and so on and so forth. And Bishop and Kettler was crucial, a crucial figure in steering Bismarck away from his anti-Catholic crusade known as the Kulturkampf and trying to explain to him that, look, uh, the worker has certain needs. Uh, we're your friend. Catholics are your friend. The communists are your enemy. And I think he succeeded. The Bismarck then implemented two of his suggestions, which were basically uh, social security for the aged and uh, health benefits, health insurance for the worker. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they stopped the, the hemorrhage of German labor to America. I am a product of that hemorrhage. <laughs> I'm half German and I'm half Irish. Uh, and they once they stopped that hemorrhage, they could concentrate labor, which is the source of all value. And within a, a, a mora around the time of the unification, following the unification, there was this incredible concentration of German labor, not without conflict, without the struggles I've already talked about. And by 1910, they had surpassed England as the most powerful economic manufacturing entity in the world. There was a lot to unpack there. Um, I, if you don't mind going back, something that you mentioned sure. right, at, right at the beginning of that was 
a, a, something to the effect of when, when you've got an economic situation, there's going to be one side that's got an advantage over the other. It, it, the the example that you gave was the employee and the employer. Typically, the employer has the advantage over the employee. Right. And I, one of the uh, – on the show, we, we talk about economics a lot, and one of the people that we've bumped into – have you heard of uh, Professor uh, Richard Vanna? No. Richard uh, Werner for uh, uh, American accent. Uh, he's he's from Germany. Uh, he, say, say his name again. Uh, uh, w- which accent do you want? <laughs> Try to say it in German. Richard What's Werner. His... Richard Werner. Yeah. No, I don't know. Go ahead. So he uh, he was uh, he he's advised quite a few central bankers. He was uh, intimately involved with the uh, uh, the Japanese meltdown, like in the early nineties or the late eighties, and essentially he's. Uh, his story is none of these central bankers listen to me. They, they, they all nod and say that they agree. And then when it turns around to, to actually what they what they need to do, they do the opposite of what I said. And uh, w- one of the things he, he does is he destroys the, the, the economic narrative. And the I mean, what is the core of the economic narrative? It's the, the supply demand curve. Right. There's that there's this equilibrium between the supply and demand curve. And he points out that, I mean, it's completely ludicrous the assumptions that you have to make in order for that to be true, and there's no evidence that suggests it's true. And in reality, just like you said, if, you, if you've if you got to buy and a sell, one side's going to have an advantage. And wh- if you, if whoever you is want, the short side has that advantage. Right, yeah. right. If you want a successful economic system, you're going to have to portray that as a moral uh, decision I, on I, both, b- both people's part. Uh-huh. That is the crux, that is the crux of what Heinrich Pesch had to say and how he basically relocated economics back in its proper matrix, which is as moral philosophy. It's not going to work any other way. What happened over this period of time is Adam Smith was hired as a professor of moral philosophy. So at that point, it was still there. But what he did was canonize, uh, uh, econo- economize uh, Newton's philosophy, which is a pagan ideology based on love and strife, and that turned it over the course of the next two centuries into pseudo physics, which I discuss in detail in the book. Well, and I don't know if you remember, I had you on the show before to uh, to discuss pseudo physics. This is when I only read about about that much of the book. Um, I, I really want to get into to, to what you just said about the uh, the basically the. The the fact that there's a short side really turns us into a moral question. But before we do that, can we can we go into the history of labor a little bit? Because I, you know, I, you said you basically start with the Medici's, but it, you, you kind of start with Rome in the book, where Christianity is basically the 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 first thing on the face of the planet that takes a look at labor differently from from everyone else, right? Can, can you can you give a little bit of an idea of how labor was valued? before Christianity and how Christianity gave that a, a facelift. Okay, to it was, give it, it the a short answer is it was not valued at all. If you look at the great uh, Greek philosophers like uh, Plato and Aristotle, you had a country basically that uh, had people who exploited labor so that they could be philosophers. They were called helots. They had to do all the work. Someone once said that uh, if you wanted, you couldn't be a citizen of Athens if you had to have a job. Because it was a full-time job just to go all to have all those discussions and all those meetings to determine policy. So you had a kind of platonic dualism that was based on the realm of forms and the realm of matter. And if you wanted to be a philosopher and de- deal with the realm of forms, you couldn't work. You and if slaves. you wanted, to, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so if you're not going to work, you have to have slaves. So this is a culture. No matter how a great one of the greatest outburst of logos in human history but it was based on contempt for human labor that was something that was done by slaves now this could not survive the advent of christianity because now the human person has a much higher value and there's no great dichotomy here between free man and slave there was in in athens they aristotle debated whether you are you uh are a slave by nature say are some people condemned to be slaves by their very nature? That we went through this in the American South, where black folk were supposed to be created by God to tote that bale and lift that barge, you know. But this is not compatible with Christianity, and so you have the advent of Christianity in Rome, the Roman Empire, 
at a time when you could you you again had contempt for labor. And the, the sign you have contempt for labor is the slave society. And the slave society comes about through usury. It's that simple. You cannot mm. talk about labor and usury without there are two sides of the same coin. And so what you had in the Roman Republic were uh, gentlemen farmers. <laughs> this is what Virginia was supposed to breed, you know, gentlemen farmers, the, the people that put you know, like George Washington put down the plow and picked up a gun and, and uh, uh, drove the English out. Those people uh, in re the Roman Republic had to buy their own weapons and they fought wars on, at their own expense. And when the wars got to expand to the Roman Empire, they lost everything because they couldn't afford to do this. And when you lose everything, you got to work for someone else. And at that time, that meant being a slave on one of the Latifundia, which were the factory farms of the of the Roman Empire. And so what you created because of usury, because you didn't have a Christian understanding of the nature of value, was a slave society at the bottom and a usury society at the top. And that wrecked the empire. It wrecked the empire. You, you cannot have usury because you can never pay off the debt. And so what the Roman Empire did was, well, we'll plunder other countries and we'll kick the debt down the road. You can only do that for a certain time. Right, and you then expand. The bill comes yeah. due. <laughs> yeah. The you bill know. comes due and, and when 476, when Romulus is up, can't pay the troops. And you know damn well the first thing that happens when you don't pay the troops is that they loot your country. And that's exactly what happened with the, the Germanic uh, invasion. My my barbarian ancestors. Well, it's it's fascinating you point that out. One of the uh, uh, topics we've we've talked about on the show is specifically that the the, the relationship between debt and slavery. And I, I just to emphasize what you're talking about, like I'm sure this goes back even further. It's just that Sumeria is they wrote the best records, and all the records they wrote were about taxes on stone. So they're they're there for us to read, right? But this was like a constant issue, even in ancient Sumeria, where the Due to usury, at some point, so much of the population would become in slaves that they regularly had to do these debt jubilees. Otherwise, the the society would crumble because because the whole right. the whole place right. turned into slaves. The, right? he, the Hebrews <laughs> had that in their in their scripture, right? They because they were inspired by God, and God knew you can't have a floating loan <laughs> forever. Right, it's going to wreck everything. You can have a floating loan for 60 years and then it's going to explode and no one can pay it off. And that'll be the end of it. So you have to have a jubilee year. You have to forgive debt. It's that simple. And we, we don't we're totally confused about that because we basically have a, a pagan concept called pacta sunt servanda. In other words, if you sign the contract, you're on the hook and you're going to pay. That's that. That's the, the what rules student loans right now. Correct. Yes. Stud th thanks for bringing student, that up. Yep. Students can't can't uh, 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 can't renege on their debts. Only the rich and the power. Donald Trump did it three times. OK, because he's too big to fail. But the poor schmuck who took out a student loan. Oh, no, you're on the hook, buddy. Oh, oh yeah. And you're yeah, never if, going to get out of it. If, if I create an entity and know how to play the credit game, like I create an LLC, I, I sign up on the right websites, I, I get the right credit accounts, I get a thing where I can, where I can loan $100,000, loan $100,000, I pay myself, don't pay it off, that thing goes bankrupt. Eh. Right? That, that's the you entity. Have, Not, no. If I know how to play the stupid game with the, with, with, with oh. the way that the rules are set up, I could totally take advantage of it, but like you said, if if, if I, I want to follow, you know, just be a good guy that does labor and, and learns, you know, I get screwed. That's right. It's insane. That's right. Donald Trump said exactly the same thing. He said you will get you. He he knew how to game the system, and that's why he became too big to fail. But uh, debt is essentially unrepayable. The whole point of this: what is economics? Economics is not some magic formula that will allow Donald Trump to get rich. If you're talking about an individual, you're really not talking about economics. Mm -hmm. Economics is the big picture. And once you look at debt over the, uh, with the perspective of the big picture, you realize it's untenable. And I think that this is exactly what Christianity understood at the beginning of that era. Uh, just as they understood that there is value to human labor, they understood that uh, usury is a sin. And you can't allow it. And it worked 
because the Roman Empire collapsed, you have a situation where there's only local economies and there's really not a whole broad, broad, big role that money plays in a local economy like this uh, after the collapse of the Roman Empire. So the, the serf comes into existence. The serf, this is a period of time when it, it, you're constantly being plagued by invasions. It's the mm -hmm. Vikings from the north. It's the Saracens from the south. When the Vikings show up and you're just this little guy with a little plot of land, you have to run to the castle and you have to wait it out, hope that they just go away. And then you go back and hope they didn't wreck your crops. And it became so uh, chronic that they said, look, I can't do this anymore. I have to become a, basically a servant to the Lord because he's got the castle. And that was the beginning of surf, the, surf, the surf system. Now, you owed that guy, you owed the Lord labor you taxes were in labor at that point you, you, you were yeah. saying you owed him labor uh, and you didn't need money that was the good part of it uh because you uh you didn't have to get money to pay taxes you paid ta taxes by giving the, the lord labor and over that period of time we had the christianity being the leaven in the loaf and so at a certain point because the serf had rights as a christian we're all power we're all children of god we're all on the le same level uh he began to have de facto property rights of this german sort which meant you could you had the right to work this property but you did not have the right to sell it and that's an important distinction so gradually that b became institutionalized and you pretty much had the right this is in england as well you had the right to use that property even though you didn't own it and there were people, a rich man would die and he'd create a purgatory society, which is basically, you could graze your sheep here if you pray for my soul. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a one of these beautiful arrangements that uh, William Cobbett talks about in his book on uh, the Reformation in England, which he describes as a looting operation, which is absolutely true. So over this period of time, you this, this evolved. And now uh, what happened as civilization became more and more complex and we're talking about the high middle ages now and italy as the absolute center of everything in the high middle ages like art but also economics and bookkeeping double entry bookkeeping was invented in venice the the germans would come down to venice to learn these techniques uh, at this point uh, and it's becoming more and more complex and at this point you need money like you're paying wages now to factory workers who are working in the cloth factories in in Florence, places like that. And if you're paying wages now, these people have to pay taxes and now you need money. And money is short because it's gold and there's not a lot of gold around. And so where do you get gold? Where do you get money? Well, you go to the Jew because the Jew was the man who lent you money at 43 and a third percent That's interest. Insane. That's <laughs> That's so high. Sorry, continue. I, it just boggles my mind that that's even if... That's if like, you're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> if you're lucky, you'll get it at 43 and a third percent interest per annum. And so immediately you've got a social problem because the people are falling into debt and they can't get out and the Jew is getting richer and he's becoming more and more arrogant the richer he gets. I mean, the classic example is Shakespeare's uh, Merchant of Venice. That's a great play and it's a great insight into the the economics of that that uh, era and the conflict about labor and, and it's it's there's a brilliant passage between antonio and shylock where uh shylock volunteers to lend him money and he says uh if if it's breed of barren metal so guess where i got the title of my book mm -hmm. uh then keep it because uh, you're not my friend if you want to lend me money and then he'd start talking about labor and shylock says my ducats can copulate faster than labor's use and rams well if well, that's it that, that's what the picture's for right you, you got mice right. which copulate qu quickly but he, the cold uh, coins don't yes right he uh shakespeare had deep roots into the tradition and he's referring to something that came from the Catena Aurea, which was a series of prayers, but it went all the way back to Aristotle, who said that money is sterile. And that's the, the Aquinas said, if you put two gold ducats in a drawer and come back six weeks later, it's all, you're only going to have two gold ducats. 
But if you put two mice in the drawer, I have to add male and female okay, <laughs> in this era, uh, you'll come back and it's full of mice. So uh, uh, money is sterile. This is exactly what Shylock is disputing. No, money isn't sterile. My ducats can copulate. Yes, at the expense of everybody else, right? He's right, he's, right, he's right in, in a very bad sense. <laughs> what he's what he's talking about is usury. Mm -hmm. So money is sterile, but if the usury gives you the illusion that the ducats can copulate, and that was the Jewish thing, and the Jews got involved, and they were just ruthlessly exploiting. Uh, the peasant class at the working class at that time. And finally, the church has to take, had to take uh, cognizance of it. And they came up with the idea of the Monte di Pietà. Again, th about 13 things I want to unpack out of that. The first is, so we, we, we talked about um, what we're, we're in Florence at this point in the conversation. How did the nobles in Florence utilize the Jewish money lenders to get around the Catholic ban on usury? Well, uh, if, if nobles, uh, uh, we're going Limitis, to include. Right. We're go we're going to include the princes of the church, the cardinals, and uh, so it, to get back to the Monte di Pietà, the the mendicant orders, the Franciscans and Dominicans came up with. It was a pawn shop for poor people, and so they would uh, and it they would charge a fee. Now there was a big controversy: is this a fee or is it usury? Mm -hmm. If I charge you five percent. Uh, if it's simple interest, then it's a fee. If it's compound interest, it's usury. And there was a lot of battle back and forth uh, between those two things. But basically, the, they they had to state the conditions. And the condition for bringing about this reform is expelling the Jews. You have to expel the Jews from your principality. But why do you have to do that? Because they are they are charging, as I said, 43 and a third percent interest. That means that they can pay 20 percent with no sweat. Would you like to get 20 percent return? On yeah, I, I got a million dollars sitting here. Hey, you could earn me 20 percent here. Here you 20, go. Yeah. <laughs> you, they, you, so the cardinal, the cardinal would go to the Jew by night and hand him his money and he got 20 percent. Well, they're. Who's going to argue with 20% and yeah. the Jew can charge 40% and the only problem is it's going to wreck your society. Okay. Well, but every, all the short term gain is an, uh, uh, argues against this type of reform. So walk me through this math. I, I was thinking about this before we got on the call. So, uh, the industry owners slash nobles, cause they're usually the same people at this time, right? They don't pay their workers enough. Now wait, we have to make a distinction. Nobles are land rich and cash poor. So they're going to the Jews as well. Mm. The Medici were manufacturers, and that's a different situation. They labor, they are involved in labor. The labor is a source of all value. These uh, textile operations were sophisticated labor, and they made a lot of money on that. Okay. okay? So let, let, thank you for, clar uh, for correcting me. Let me clarify. The Medicis, who are the people who are in charge of this industry, they don't pay their workers enough. Then they turn around and demand taxes that the workers can't afford because they're not getting paid enough. And so in order to pay the taxes, the workers go to the Jewish moneylender, having to pawn tools that are necessity a necessity for them to earn a living in the future. How – I mean it kind of explains itself, but tell me how this uh, quickly unravels everything. Well, for, for, <laughs> first of all <laughs> – the Medici. So, first of all, what did the Medici do? They made a ton of money by exploiting the workers, and then they, hey, we're going to become bankers now. We're getting out of the cloth business, and we'll we'll make money hand over fist, just like the Jews, and we'll lend. We'll do the big time finance. We'll let the Jews do the petty stuff, and we're going to lend to princes. Great idea. Oh, wait a minute. Not a great idea because what happens when the prince doesn't pay you back? You can't do well, anything you about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can. You can. You just get an army bigger than the prince's army. And then you fight him. And that that, that was known as the British Empire. That's the way they did it, the British Navy. But anyway, that's the problem. So by the time of Lorenzo, uh, he looks at the books and says, oh, no, we're bankrupt. So what's he do? He creates uh, Carnival. He creates the Renaissance, basically, to distract everyone from the fact that he's bankrupt and stealing from the city treasury. You know, but I mean, that's what happened. 
they they lent out the money, the princes stiffed them, and suddenly they're bankrupt, and there is a huge, absolutely huge crisis. And at this moment, Savonarola stepped in, the great reformer. If if the if the if the Pope had listened to Savonarola, there would have been no Martin Luther. This, this was this a priest? I'm trying. There's so many names in your in the book. <laughs> uh, remind me who the, who this person was. He was again. a. a, a um, a, a Dominican, am I right here? A Dominican friar. He was an order, a priest who was an order, uh, and he was a great speaker and great reformer. And he basically mobilized the entire population of Florence, brought about religious reform, uh, uh, famous for his bonfire of the vanities, where basically <laughs> he'd pile up, bring everything that's a near this occasion. Familiar. Said, yeah. We'll burn it. We'll burn it. And one of the guys who showed up was uh, Botticelli, who was the propagandist for uh, Lorenzo. He threw paintings on there. We never know what they were, but everybody thinks it's a great uh, loss to the art where they were probably pornography because that's what uh, those that's people what they were wanted doing. at that yeah. time. Uh, they put firecrackers in there. It was a great show. And after he did that, some Jew came to him and said, I'd like to buy it from you. <laughs> anyway, he says, no, he's interested in reform. And then uh, basically uh, the Medici realized and the other oligarchs realized this reform means the end of our uh, gravy train here. It be, because we're putting an end to the what is uh, the usury that is the source of our wealth. Right, we're stealing. The usury. reform says stop stealing, so we won't be able to continue stealing. So, uh, <laughs> right? <and> the, I mean, <laughs> the infallible sign when, that you've entered the decadent end game is sodomy and usury, and both of those were f flagrantly uh, in place in Florence at that time. It I forgot Dante, all about Dante, that from your book. Yeah, go into that more. Yeah, Dante. Dante was a Florentine. I saw his house. Florence is, was a tough town, you know. If you live in the Midwest, like I do in South Bend, Indiana, you have a porch, you know, and you kind of sit there on a summer day and you wave to your neighbors as they walk by. Every house in Florence was a a, a, a fortress, and Dante's house was no different. But and when the gangs started going around and be, when the Guelphs started fighting it out with the Ghibellines, you just went back into your fortress and waited it out. But Dante said in the uh, in the Divine Comedy that uh, put sodomites and usurers in the same circle in hell because the sodomite takes what is fertile, namely sex, mm. and makes it sterile. And the usurer takes what is sterile, namely money, and makes it fertile through uh, compound interest, usury. So that that was the situation. Nobody, the Pope, Savonarola challenged the Pope. The Pope allied himself with the Medici, and they basically uh, murdered Savonarola. And that was the last chance of internal reform because the next guy to come down was, was Luther. And that led to a catastrophe for all of Europe. Let's uh, let's talk about that. So the the way you, I remember you describing it in the book is that in in this era, right before Luther, there's this battle happening, and so Vol Volaroa is is leading the one side of the battle, and pretty much everybody else is on the other side, right? <laughs> uh, every big name in at the time is is on the other side, and once the Protestant Reformation happens, first through Luther, and then there's other people. Uh, the ca the Catholic idea loses control over the conversation the, on I, I'd say more specifically, Catholic police power mm. is broken mm -hmm. in certain countries. So England, England, and Holland are the ones that immediately spring to mind. So, well, getting to England, I definitely want to get to England, but starting with Luther, what is it? particularly about the Protestant Reformation that seems to be the same through all the, all these Protestant waves that says either usury is great or we don't care anymore. Well, it didn't happen with Luther. So first of all, what is the Reformation? The Reformation is a looting operation. Mm -hmm. now, in Give England, details about that. The, the first time I ever heard that expressed that way was when I read, read your book. So there was no theological justification whatsoever 
for the Reformation in England. None whatsoever. It was all just uh, basically uh, aristocrats who were in debt. So how do I, you can't get out of debt. Uh, you have to repudiate the debt, but you're looking around and, you know, in Bohemia, it happened earlier with the Hussite rebellion, but 80% of the property in Bohemia was owned by the church. And you're talking about significant amounts of property in all of these countries owned by the church. And the aristocrats are now being squeezed. Okay. And, and then, the uh, class. Sorry to interrupt you quick. They, they, they got in this position, if I remember correctly, they got in this position because they, they're they basically trying to outdo each other socially and they got to get money. And they typically raise that money by putting mortgages on their, on their right. estates. Absolutely. And then Ar compound Arist interest, they can't pay it back. What do we do? You lose the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, so uh, basically, yeah, aristocrats are land rich and cash poor. They, it, they've never been anything else. And it, the way you turn land into cash is called labor, <laughs> but you're not going to get labor immediately. Okay. Like I need it today, you know, and that's mm -hmm. when you're tempted to go to the user and uh, get uh, a mortgage on your property. The, 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 the uh, classic artistic expression of this is Shakespeare's Timon of Athens. It's a play that most people don't know, uh, but it's about, Whenever Shakespeare is talking about ancient Greece, you know he's talking about England. And it's about what happened to that first generation of looters. What happened to the first generation? They got rich immediately. They had a big party. And then suddenly they started uh, mortgaging. That They stole church land and they started mortgaging it so that the party would continue. And it, wait a minute, at a certain point, the Jew took over. They lost their property. This is a constant problem uh, in England. And that was the problem with the Reformation. But the Reformation was a looting operation. It had no theological justification in England. It had some theological justification in Germany. I mean, I don't, I don't mean justification. So if you want to talk about, uh, you know, indulgences, that was the uh, Luther the had some issue. legitimate complaints. Can, can I, can Everybody I put it that has. Yeah. A, do you think we have legitimate <laughs> complaints now about the state of the church? Yeah. I mean, when don't you have legitimate, legitimate complaints about the state of the church? But at this point, you had the rise of a new class of people like the Medici, and then in, in Germany, in Augsburg, and that there was no Germany at that point, but uh, they were known as the Fugger family, um, and they were cloth manufacturers. It's, you can't underestimate the importance of manufacturing cloth as the way uh, to wealth and the beginning of advanced economies. Uh, and the Fuggers were making cloth. They came up with a new cloth. And suddenly they have a, a lot of money because labor is a source of all value. And then you have that lower aristocracy symbolized by Ulrich von Hutten. Uh, they're losing out. And the, the, so lots of times you blame something else and they started blaming Rome. Germany is bleeding gold down to Rome. Rome is the problem. Well, that is certainly what, well, that was music to the German aristocrats ears because it diverted everyone attention, everyone's attention from them and what they were doing. And what they planned to do was basically the theft of church property. It allowed the theft of church property. If you think that the Reformation was theological, you're wrong. It was economic. That's why I covered the Reformation in Byron Metal and not some book on theology. Every, if you want my take on Luther, I did it earlier. It's in the last chapter in Degenerate Moderns. I mean, my Protestant separated brethren loved Degenerate Moderns until they got to the last chapter. And then I, I can kind of understand why they didn't like it because I said that Luther was a pimp and, you know, People got upset by that, but it's true. And, and if you look into Luther's life, he's the classic example of someone who subordinated reality to his desires. And I'm talking specifically about his treatise on the will, de servo arbitro, where he said, basically, there's no free will. And God's responsible for evil. So don't blame me. I, God did it. God made me do it. Well, that was Luther. I, I, there's something really to... Uh, I stood out to me when I, when I remember reading this part, and I'm glad you brought up the no free will thing, is that Luther had this exaggerated notion of original sin, which is just, it, it, correct me if I'm remembering this or saying it incorrectly, which is to say, 
okay, uh, there was original sin, we're, we're all fallen, we're all damned, and because there's really no free will, you can't actually do anything about that. You, you, you have to accept Christ, and, and, and that does everything, which is why works isn't important, and there's only faith. And right. the economic result of that is no one's building institutions to actually do good stuff. Because why bother? Because you can't fix it. Because there's a detached de- notion de- of original sin. The, the Reformation, uh, Luther's ideology had a devastating effect on Germany. A mm-hmm. devastating effect. And they basically had to pull themselves out of it by basically abandoning Luther's theology. You know, if you're, you don't have free will, well, wait a minute. That, yeah, what's that, the point that, of anything? <laughs> yeah, why, why get out of bed in the morning? You yeah. know what I mean? I, I think I have free will. I mean, I, I did get out of bed this morning. Uh, but I guess I'm, it's an illusion. Well, that cuts the nerve of industry, and it had a devastating effect on Germany, uh, and that was part part of the problem. But you had this resentment uh, at uh, the rising uh, industrial class on the part of the impoverished aristocracy, and that fueled this thing, and they couldn't res- restrain themselves, and so they started stealing church property. This uh, R.H. Tawney, I don't think he understands. He, he wrote a book called Religion and the Rise of Capitalism. He's a great writer. I don't think he understood what was going on, but he said <laughs> the 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 upstart aristocracy had their teeth in the carcass and they weren't going to be whipped off by a sermon. <laughs> that's, a, that's the Reformation. That is exactly the Reformation. It's a brilliant uh, uh, encapsulation of the Reformation. So... How did the looting operation, particularly in England, because if if I remember the book correctly, England was <laughs> they looted the best. If am, am I am I getting that right? Of all the looting operations that happened, they were the all Protestant looters. Uh, okay, <laughs> well, how did the stolen property in England give rise to the birth of I, I guess what's modern economic theory? Okay. The stolen property needed to be monetized, and the only way they could do it was by borrowing money. Now, that's not true, okay? That's the quickest way to do it, but you can also have rent, you know? And at this point, you charging people rent to use the, uh, to use the land. This was different and so than what had been before, where you got a, a, a kind of socialization of the property through the church. And I've already mentioned the Purgatory Society. Mm-hmm. At this point, you're talking about England as a third world country that supplied raw materials to Florence. Uh, and the raw material they supplied was wool, raw wool. Uh, and so they suffer the fate of pretty much all third world countries that are basically colonies and they're exploited and they, because the the increase of surplus value is cut off at the very basis. So obviously it's labor to shear the sheep, but if you just waited a little bit and turned it into cloth, you'd have a bigger, a much, uh, a much more amount of money to be used. Uh, and that's precisely what the Florentines were, were doing. Okay. They were, so England is, is a, is a third world country uh, until uh, it starts to concentrate labor and the big breakthrough here. So what happened? Okay, let me get back to there. You dispossessed a whole group of people. And those group, Belloc talks about the people who were just the the proletariat, the land, uh, the people who worked the land were just kicked out. And the aristocrats turned uh, the, that farm air land now into basically a grazing area for sheep so that they could sell it to the, to the Florentines. And at a certain point, uh, what you had was the rise of technology. Uh, Newton played a role in this, uh, but you had the rise of technology. And then suddenly in the uh, 18th century, you have the use of steam and you have suddenly you have the factory system coming into England, which uh, what took place on the land of somebody, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. if the aristocrat is now getting, has a factory, he's making serious money. Okay. And that's, that was the transformation that took place. In England, it's called the Industrial Revolution, and the English uh, were particularly good at it. And they reached the point where they could create cloth. We're still talking about cloth now. 
uh, cheaper than anybody in the world. And at that point, they became devotees of free trade because they knew they could undercut anybody's price. Well, and that's that's what I wanted to get into. What was the moral justification? Because I, 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 big book took me a while to get through it. I'm vaguely remembering these parts, right? Is I, I seem to remember a part where the whole Isaac Newton kind of morphing into Adam Smith thing, the pseudo physics. There was a large component of that that was needed in order to justify the looting operation that happened so these people who did the looting could get over their guilt and that the, the, the economic ideas that came out justified that operation. Right. That's true. That's exactly what happened. So, uh, but, 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 you know, if you're getting talking about Newton, Newton was a Whig and he was part of that Whig oligarchy that basically took over England after the Glorious Revolution when they decided they're not going to have a legitimate Catholic king. They're going to bring in a Protestant. This was King Billy the Dutchman of William of Orange. And he the one thing he wanted to do was wage war with France. He hated France. And the English thought that's just a good idea because we hate France too, because they're in a battle at this point. They sort of conquered Spain. And now the next country on the agenda is France. They're going to contest them for world hegemony. And so what they did, uh, the Whigs did, was got into usury. They created the Bank of England. And the first guy that they lent money to was the king. Well, this is great now. This is Cobbett is a genius when he describes it. He, he immediately turned England into a country of taxpayers and tax eaters. And if you were on the right side, if you're on the right side of compound interest, you've got it made. Mm -hmm. And the main re, the main thing that fails is the the the, the sucker can't pay, uh, just runs out of money. But if you're the treasury of the country is being paid to you as the owner of the Bank of England, you've got it made. Uh, for a while, nothing's, nothing's permanent. And so what happened is uh, they became very rich. They became very rich with usury. Uh, the problem came in, as it always does, uh, between 60 and 70 years later. And that's when the Americans entered the story, because at this point, Lord Townsend went to Adam Smith and said, we got a problem. It's a, called a floating loan. You can't have a floating loan for more than 60 years. And at that point, uh, it became unrepayable. And Townsend said to Smith, what are we going to do? And Smith says, I know, we'll have the Americans pay it off. Well, that didn't work out for them because it led immediately, not immediately, but very shortly to the American Revolution. That's what that revolution was about. They tried to foist their unrepayable loan on the colonies and the the colonies rejected it. They would. It was the the Stamp Act, and then it was the T. They're going to tax T, and the colonies had had enough, and that led to the American Revolution. You mentioned free trade, um, getting into you know. So England starts developing this cloth that they they develop at the cheapest, and they start foisting it on other countries. Talk a little bit. Actually, before I say that, let me let me kind of give the libertarian free trade argument here, right? Because there, there's this idea that, hey, look, we're against violence. We're against the initiation of the use of force. So what free trade is, is is two parties being able to trade with each other freely without a third party coming in saying, no, you have to do what I say, or you have to give me taxes, or I got to make regulations. They can, do, they can do it freely without the immorality of the initiation of the use of force. Now, that sounds great. Tell me about the reality of what free trade does. You were you were just about well, to get into all right. it. I'll, I'll, get, I'll give you the uh, the Pesh, Pesh's explanation as the theological explanation for trade. It's basically that the goods of this world are not distributed equally, and so in certain areas you have more than you need, and you have a surplus, and it's just going to rot because we can't we can't put it to use. Uh, other people would love that surplus. It's valuable, much more valuable to them. And so basically you got to travel across the ocean and get it. So pepper grows on trees and it just falls down. Who cares? But it became the basis for, for money that I he just did last week when I had the Germans here, the guy said to me, <coughs> he's a Pfefferzak. Pfefferzak means rich man because pepper was very valuable at yeah. that point. So there's a justification. So, you know, I mean, Ricardo understood it. He said, basically, you can you can plant a vineyard on Iceland, 
and, and you can say that labor is the source of all value. And so therefore you should be able to produce wine on Iceland. Well, I, maybe you could do it if you really struggled, but why are you doing it on Iceland? Iceland should concentrate on cod uh, and let, let the people in Portugal make the, make the wine because it just happens there naturally. So Karl Marx got stuck with this thing because he tried to, he understood that labor is the source of all value. And then he tried to come up with a price based on labor. Well, you can't do that because <clears throat> you can put a lot of effort into your vineyard in Iceland and you're going to end up with crappy wine after a lot of effort. And nobody wants and, it. Yeah. And nobody wants it and you can't sell it. So labor obviously is the source of value, but you need a market. You need people to come together and agree on this, that I'll buy it. Uh, and if the Portuguese can come up with better wine, cheaper, but buy it from them. That makes sense. Now, this is can be extrapolated and it can you can turn it into the ideology of free trade which is basically nothing should be protected. The English didn't do that anyway, but they they protected the one thing that you should protect, and this became obvious at the beginning of the 19th century, is manufacturing. You shouldn't subject that because that's an incredibly powerful source of value that needs to be protected. And the guy who understood over here was Alexander Hamilton and uh, wrote a treatise on manufacturers. Uh, and America then... Uh, the uh, the famous German, <laughs> who was this guy? He came here. I'm drawing a blank here. The guy who came, the uh, protectionist. Uh, yeah, anyway, he came here, uh, worked in Pennsylvania, came to Philadelphia, the beginning of early 19th century, uh, went to Reading. Uh, there was a German newspaper called the Reddinger Adler, and he was the editor who wrote for it. And while he was in Reading, he discovered coal. And he decided, well, I'm going to, uh, you know, exploit that. And he took out a loan to was building a railroad and the, 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 the economy went bust and he had to pay his loan back and he defaulted and couldn't do it. That was the lesson that he learned and less what he was started talking about was you need to protect manufacturers. Because the Pesh, I mean, uh, Pesh, one of these people said, look, it's like the difference between the apple and the apple tree. Which is more valuable? If suppose you can get apples cheap from somebody or other over there, uh, maybe we've already given this example. Well, maybe if it's Iceland and wine and grapes, well, it's never going to succeed. So we have to buy it from them. But if it's something equal, the apple tree is more important than the apple because, uh, you know, the apple continues to produce. And this is a lesson that you have to learn about money. Uh, you know, money. <laughs> is sterile it doesn't produce anything the only purpose of money is to enable the production of something or other there's a medium of exchange or other reasons too and that's what they learned with manufacturing and at this point the main enemy of local manufacturing was england because they can produce things much cheaper than any place else in the world and the conflict in the united states came between the northern states which were struggling to get these manufacturing operations off the ground. It was one, and somebody from New England went to England and memorized the spinning jenny and built one over <laughs> here because they wouldn't let the plan out. Mm -hmm. But that's only one part of the country. The South has the exact opposite position because we produce cotton. It's too hot to have factories down here. You can't do that. We don't have a skilled workforce. We've got these black slaves from Africa. They can pick the cotton. And so we are ha very happy to just be a colony of England and just product give them raw material, just in the same way that the English were just producing wool for the, the Florentines in the 15th century. So that became the big struggle. And that became uh, the argument against free trade, which basically uh, List, Friedrich List is the guy's name. Uh, yes, I remember, the, okay, I remember the great, that name the great, the chapter, the great yeah. protectionist. It takes a while for my old brain to produce these. Well, when, when you've got four thousand names in each one of your books, I'm, I'm yeah, I think of all the names I have circulated. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was Friedrich List who basically convinced uh, the Americans that uh, protectionism was the way to go, and then he went back to Germany and convinced the Germans that the same thing was true, and that basically stopped. 
the hemorrhaging of labor that was uh, crippling Germany at the time. He did it in conjunction with the railroads, the railroads, and uh, he convinced the Germans to abolish all internal tariffs. So it, at the time of Luther, if you went from uh, Thuringia to to the Bla to the Baltic, you had to pass through twenty different countries, and everyone would pay, you had to pay a tax at every border. He said, "This is crazy. Abolish all internal tariffs. Put up external tariffs to keep the English." cotton to English manufacturers out, and that will grow the country. This is true. He was absolutely right. Hamburg didn't like it because they were tra they were closely allied with the British. It's true to this day, and the classic example of what I'm talking about is Iran. They didn't have tariffs. They had sanctions. This is the blessing of sanctions because it allowed them to create uh, domestic products. Uh, they were forced to do it because sanctions are just another word. Uh, tariffs backwards, basically. Tariffs. Yeah. So this this is one of the things that fascinated me when, when you were in the chapters of what you're discussing right here on free trade, which is essentially, okay, it sounds all nice and good that, hey, everybody should be able to trade freely. However, if it's done in a way that either destroys or prevents the development of manufacturing in another country – I mean, I don't know if that's outright war, but that's it's war. You're 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 in that spectrum, <laughs> right? right? Look, I, look, I just gave you an example of where the blessings of sanctions. Another example is when I went to Kenya, and I'm, you know, you take all over the traveling all over the country, and you show up in a town, and the, there's the marketplace, and what do you see? from as far as the eye can see. Never been used to Kenya. Oh, you used, yeah. Used, used T-shirts. Used T-shirts. They, they have a word for it. The Swahili word is matumba. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. I think I think there's a message here. I think there's a message. So I, I, one of the times I went to Kenya, I went to the Kabira slum, which is the biggest slum in the world. And nobody knows how many people are there. But the thing that struck me when I went through the Kabira slum is Everybody's got a shop there. Everybody's selling something. Well, wait a minute. Why aren't we all rich then? Well, because no, there's no surplus value here. Nobody's making anything. N nobody's just... making anything. That's where the that's where the value comes in. So they're buying it from China. They're buying cheap junk from China, which is now the successor to England in terms of the manufacturing powerhouse. And you got to buy dollars first, and you buy them with worthless shillings, and you lose money there, and then you get junk here, and it's everybody's poor. All this economic exchange and everybody's poor because they're not producing anything. And I, at this point, all of these ideas, having re having written Baron Metal, I'm thinking all these ideas are circulating in my head about cloth manufacture as the beginning of all advanced economies. And then I bump into a Sicilian who had been teaching at the Opus Dei School there since the 1960s. He said, when I arrived in Nairobi, I you couldn't buy a shirt. You had to have it custom made mm -hmm. because there were tailors. There was cloth. They had a cloth manufacturing business. They were growing cotton. They were growing wool in Eldoret, that high part where all the long distance runners come from. And you had an econ a basis for the economy that was obliterated. And it was obliterated by the Jewish rag pickers from New Jersey. That's what I found out. And, and the, the method that they used, of course, is free trade. Right, because if Kenya is able, so so able to put tariffs up and say no, we don't want your freaking T-shirts. That's exactly yeah. what they did. Every all of the major countries in East Africa woke up to this fact and they said, "Okay, put tariffs, no more matumba." And as soon as they did that, the Jewish rag pickers from New Jersey, this is the people who created the Goodwill box, okay, because they take it and then they sell it again. The Jewish rag pickers went to Se uh, Secretary of Treasury Menuhin who's a Jew as well. So it's one Jew to another, you know what's going to happen. And Nukin threatened all these East African countries with sanctions. And they all backed down, except for one country, Rwanda, did not back down. And if I if I have been watching my YouTube videos correctly, Rwanda is actually doing pretty well right now. Yes. <laughs> yes. Rwanda, Rwanda is doing well. And so there were immediately every... Every newspaper started jumping on Kagame, the guy who solved that Hutu Tutsi crisis. 
and they got interview people in Rwanda. And they're all complaining, oh, clothing is much too expensive now. We need to go. No. What you're saying is that the people are earning more money uh, and because they're, uh, they, can, they are charging you more, which means they earn more money. And so you have more money in circulation. That's the whole thing. And th the stupid kind of free trade argument of, you know, cheap T-shirts is going to save the economy. It's, it's the exact opposite. So I'm met. So I'm, I'm going around. They're taking me from one Catholic school to another. Big, big Catholic school. So we're in uh, Cockamega, I think. And this guy, go to a Catholic school. There are thousands of students in the school. And they all wear school uniforms. And suddenly I had this idea. What we need to do is have the Catholic schools start manufacturing clothing based on the production of cotton. And then I met the chancellor of the diocese. I, I think it was, no, it was Bungoma. Anyway, I met the chancellor of the diocese of Bungoma, and he said to me, yeah, my father put me through school by growing cotton. So I said, great, what's he doing now? Well, no one grows cotton anymore because you can't, you're, under, you're being undercut by cheap T-shirts. Well, the cotton's manufacturing in Texas by these huge combines with all these chemicals, and then you send it to China and they crank it out, and so it's dirt cheap, and so nobody can raise cotton anymore, and so there's no basis for the economy. That's the cause of poverty in Kenya. Now, what really gets me about this conversation, again, I got from your book, is the proponents of free trade. And I mean, let, let's bring it all the way back to Adam Smith. We'll say that's our, our founding point, right? They're all about free trade if it benefits them, but they're all about government if it benefits them too. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> uh, the, the, the two examples I remember specifically were the uh, Irish famine and uh, the the post-World One obsession between the Federal, the guy running the Federal Reserve, I can't remember his name, and I believe Montague Norman running the Bank of England. Yeah, yeah Like, yeah. we've got to get the gold standard back to this arbitrary exchange rate because we don't know why. It just has to happen because of, you know, free trade. And, I, I, I mean, I, I want you to extrapolate on this, but the funny thing that you pointed out was, okay, having the gold standard on free trade is supposed to self-regulate, so why do you have to force it to the... <laughs> Why do you have to force it to the exchange rate that it's supposed right. to be at for some reason? Yeah. 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 yeah I, I, these libertarians uh, love the gold standard. And uh, <laughs> Murray Rothbart wrote a book on money. And it was right out of Shylock. <laughs> he said, my ducats swell during periods of deflation. Well, yeah. If that's you have right. ducats. If, yeah. But if <laughs> you don't have ducats, you're screwed. That's the problem. That's exactly the problem. So it was Jewish economics, which means it's a contradiction. Economics is the entire economy. It's not how a particular group can make money uh, coming and going. That's not economics. That's Crestamathy or something like that. That's how to create, how to make money. We're talking about two different things here, you know? And so that's the gold standard. I, that whole section on the gold standard in America was how it absolutely crippled the economy. Because, you know, you've got certain uh, uh, needs, okay? Let's say it's water, and, and you've got a whole farm that you have to irrigate. But well, wait a minute, all the water has to come out through a hole this big. Well, that's what the gold standard is, a hole this big. Uh, and what happens is the money doesn't get out, so the, price, the prices go, go up. Uh, uh, and that's exactly what happened to the American farmer when they had— um, during the Civil War, you got two dollars for a bushel of grain because you had greenbacks, and it kind of liberated the economy, uh, freed up the economy. And then they go back on the gold standard. So they ended the 19th century. The same farmers making 50 cents for a bushel. Well, they're only 24 hours in the day, so they're all going to go bust, uh, largely because in order to get through the next year, you have to go into debt. And it was all the Jews who were the furnishing merchants in the South and the conquered South uh, who just took over the entire economy and then they looted it and then went by the Solomon brothers went back and created a bank in New York and the people who got kicked off the land, they went to Texas, which has the strictest usury laws in the United States or did. I don't know. I'm not sure what, what the story is now. So uh, something fascinating, you, you just alluded to it with uh, Murray Rothbard is on the libertarian side of things. There, there's this really caveman attitude of, Deflation good, inflation bad. Rah, that 
that, that's, that's kind of the extent of the argument. And, like, the, the gravest blasphemy that you could commit is to not say that inflation is, like, the worst thing in the world, right? It, it, like, it, inflation is, is, is the, the most horrifying thing that can ever possibly happen according to, according to the libertarian mindset. And you pointed this out in the book on for the crime of 73. We were just talking about it, getting back on the gold standard, um, how this affected the, the farmers. But just in general, like, okay, like you said, um, I'm going to start a business. I got a farm. I'm going to – I got to borrow money for seed or irrigation or whatever, right? I got a loan that has a payment of X. Next year, we go at a gold standard, and everything deflates to um, – the prices go to 50% of what they were before. Well, guess what? Your loan payment didn't change. That's right. That's exactly so, the whole so, point. So the, the products don't get cheaper. I just go out of business. That's right. That, that's, <laughs> exact, that's exactly what happened. I said, uh, what is, there is no shared risk in a loan. That's one of the fundamental principles you have to understand. There's no shared risk in a loan. Uh, if you have the need of money, you should have a corporation and sell stock in your corporation because that uh, is shared risk. So if you don't have a good year, uh, the stockholders don't get a dividend. That's that's a legitimate use of set, putting money out to uh, to other people. I want to play devil's but, advocate with you on this one. Uh, but finish first. Finish first. Yeah. So this the reason the, the uh, so the Fed was created. Because J.P. Morgan died, and he was a guy who could mobilize uh, enough capital to stop runs on the bank, and now no one replaced him, so they decided we're going to have a federal agency. Uh, to, it's, it's obviously it's having your cake and eating it too. It's public in the sense that it's the money supply, but it's private because it's owned by certain people. So it's here heads I win, tails you lose. But uh, at, at, at any rate, <clears throat> it was created. Because as of 1910, uh, the manufacturers in the Midwest, 90% of their capital improvements were done with profit. Well, that's great because you don't have to borrow money for that. Mm -hmm. You're using, you're plowing the money back into the operation and you're having a, uh, a putting it to good use again and you're increasing the productivity. Well, they didn't like that. Uh, they wanted to lend the money. There's a guy, a Jew by the name of Samuel Roth, wrote a book called Jews Must Live. And it's exactly about this way. Of, he talks about a, a, ma a furniture manufacturer and the Jew comes to him and says, uh, would you like to increase production? Well, of course, I want to increase production and increase sales. Well, I'll lend you the money. You can expand. Well, that's the fatal mistake because as soon as he lends money, then he becomes the controller and the guy goes bankrupt and he ends up being an employee of the corporation he used to loan because he allowed those people in to lend him money. Okay, I'm ready I like that. This 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 will be good for jumping off of the devil's advocate thing. So this this is totally splitting hairs, and I'm not disagreeing with you on principle. I'm I'm potentially disagreeing with how do, how do we massage this right? So I um a, a little over a year ago, I acquired a business. I, I went to uh I, I went to a seminar that that taught how to how to acquire businesses, and I did it through a commercial loan. So I I. I Found found someone who wanted to sell. I was able to uh, convince him to get uh, carry a note, uh, forty percent of the deal. I, w I went over to the bank, talked to a bunch of banks, and I said, "Okay, here's my equity. Here's forty percent." And uh, I found a bank who was who was willing to do that. And through that, I was able to get the financing to get the deal done. Now, the way that I did it, I didn't have to give up any control of the business for someone who brought money to the deal. Now. It's true what you just said, which is if I got a bad year and I can't make the payments, the whole I mean, the whole thing goes up. That's right. You but, lost everything. But I didn't I didn't have to give up any control. Well, if you're borrow money, you're giving up control. Because you have that hanging over you. If you if suddenly there's a downturn in the economy or whatever, or the, whatever it is, mm -hmm. the crop fails or whatever it is, and you borrowed money to buy the machinery. They don't. They don't take that into consideration. They're they're not sharing risk with you. You're on the hook. Sorry, if you don't make your payment, it uh, you, you, they take over your company. It's that simple. Well, and the, again, I'm not uh, now obviously now the, uh, my friend the quant from Wall Street 
told me that liberal bankruptcy laws are the only thing that keep this country, the economy afloat. Right. Now, if you're a poor schmuck with a student loan, that doesn't apply that doesn't to apply. you. Correct. But if you're Donald Trump or whatever, you know what I mean? You basically sit down and say, OK, sorry, I can't pay back your loan. You're going to have to take a haircut. And this is a traditional back and forth. And that's the way you would resolve the issue uh, w with if the fact that you run into trouble and you're going to run into trouble because uh, once usury gets into the economy, everything gets more expensive. And you need more usury to cover it. And at a certain point, you, or, you know, you just caught, you get caught suddenly. They don't, they won't renew you. They won't roll over your loan or something like that. Refinance, this is standard yeah. creature. You know what I mean? Suddenly they're not going to do it. And suddenly someone's there waiting at your door, ready to buy up your operation at pennies on the dollar. And if you're lucky, you'll end up working for the for the company that you used to own to uh to uh exacerbate that so this this was my first deal and i, I was pretty excited about it and one thing i i overlooked is i got an adjustable rate loan oh no oh, now, no. now, now uh, uh, let me say so p part of what i learned is that you make sure that your cash flow to debt service ratio when, when, when you're looking at a potential deal you have to have at minimum 1.5 times cash flow to debt service basically saying if if i, I got a, a dollar going out on debt I need to have $1.5 net, not gross, because I mean, I got to pay my expenses. After paying all my expenses, I got to have one and a half dollars left over to pay that that one dollar. And in my conversation with bankers, let, let me just tell you how wild this is. I had some bankers tell me that they will accept, uh, 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 they'll do a loan on a 1.1 debt uh, cash service to debt flow ratio. I was like, <laughs> I mean, you get one little blip in the business and then then you, you can't pay your they debt want, back. They right? want you, they want to get yeah, you my, on the hook. Oh, their man. job, their job is to get you on the hook and well, they'll do whatever, whatever it takes to get you on the hook. I, li, li, I had a friend who was uh, working for the bank here in town and they changed the law so that uh, you could lend money to people in Elkhart County. Elkhart County is where they build recreational vehicles. Mm -hmm. So now they can finance recreational vehicles. So a guy 70 some years old shows up at the bank and wants to buy a hundred thousand dollar RV. And why, I don't know what the terms are like, like a 10 year loan, a 20 year loan. And my, my friend looks at it and said, this is crazy. He'll just drive off and we'll never see him again. Not like a house. Yeah. So he, he denied the loan within five minutes. He was called into the president's office. And the guy says, you are going to approve every single loan that gets, comes, comes in here. And why is that? Because they the can minute, sell it. <laughs> they can sell exactly the paper. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what they did. They sell the loan and you're you're off the hook. We don't care. That's someone else's problem now. If, he, if the old guy drives off with the RV and we never see him again, that's someone else's problem. And you have people like Paul Singer, one of the boovers and shakers in the Republican Party, specializes in buying up distressed debt. Like Argentina. Mm-hmm. Argentina, they had already worked out the deal. They were taking a haircut, 10 cents on the dollar. Uh, Paul Singer buys it up, takes the case to a Jewish judge in New York, and he declares, no, the deal is off. Uh, you're going to get full face value and wrecks the Argentine economy by doing that. Which is uh, Argentina, last I checked, is paying something like 118% on bonds right now. <laughs> <laughs> something i shouldn't be laughing about but i i just wanted to explicate what you're talking about okay uh another devil's advocate thing here so um there there was a chapter later in the book it had to do with an italian guy and uh, i'd say check it to watch let me know if you're running running up on time or something here that there was an italian guy i i can't remember his name but there was this conversation of are there two different categorical types of usury? Let me let me explain what I'm talking about here. So I just talked about this loan I got from a bank. I did get an adjustable rate mortgage, but it, I'm not mortgage. It's not mortgage. It's a, a, a loan. Um, right. But you know, I, I think I, it started off at seven percent, and I'm and I'm up to eleven, which sucks. But I I I did the deal right, and it's it's not killing me. I I, I, can, I can handle it. Now I get. Now I get these phone calls. I think I've gotten maybe three since we started this this conversation of money brokers. 
They're calling right. me all the time. And at first, I was like, you know what? I'm curious. You know, t- t- tell me what you're offering. And, you know, they've got the fees and the time. Like, they don't know how to manipulate all the variables, so, so you don't know what's going on. I know how to do the math, and I'd say, okay, tell, okay, what's the fee? How, you know, what's the time frame I got to pay this back, and what's the rate? Okay, and I do the math, and I'm like, I, I am not exaggerating when I say this. This is two hundred and seventy nine percent interest. <laughs> oh no, no, no! We have the best rates. At like, dude, I can do the math, right? right. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, it's 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 fifteen percent over five months. For a hundred thousand dollars, and you're taking it's fifty percent interest, oh, but you're taking fifteen percent up what front, right? I'm like, I might as well just give you the damn business. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this, right. This, this happened. It, it gets out. There was a, a group. Uh, we have these payday loan operations here, and there was a payday loan operation in England. It was called Wongo, which is the Cockney word for money. And uh, the bishops, the Anglican bishops, decided to get socially involved, and they attacked Wonga. Uh, saying that they charge 5,000% interest. And Wonga re- just re- went right back and said, this is a damnable lie. It's 500. We, ha- <laughs> Sorry. we have never charged more than 4,000% interest. Well, oh, this God. is ruthless, ruthless exploitation of of people who, who can't do math. Who are, yeah. <laughs> mo- most vulnerable people in the culture and you're burdening them with an unpay- unrepayable loan and you're going to haunt it, you know, char- haunt them to their grave with this type of thing. So please don't, you know, it's I, yeah. I, I mean, so I th- this is the point that I want to talk about it. A question for you, is there a categorical difference between, I, I mean, forget that it's adjustable rate at the moment. I got this loan that, that's with, within the cash flow to debt service ratio. I, I, I feel confident that, I, you know, I'm going to, if something goes wrong, I'm going to be not paying taxes before I not pay, <laughs> not pay. I pay three times more in taxes than I pay in, in loan payments, you're, right? You're like, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're like, you're like the guy that jumped out of the hundredth floor of a building and he went past uh, the 70th floor and someone asked him if he's okay and he said so far uh, i'm okay now i'll be fine you know, I, I, I set this one up correctly I'll, I'll i'll be fine but i do see the point i do see the point that you're so, making. so far it's okay so far it's okay and it's okay until it's not okay and this is not a situation we should put people in in the situation where everybody has to go to the user in order to i agree with bring, that yes do something that's yes. not a, that's not a good system. One group benefits from this system, and everyone else suffers. Well, and that's that's part of the problem. Then the other problem is that everything, whenever credit or money lending gets in, the cost goes through the roof. That happened with housing. It happened with education. It will happen with anything. Anytime you can borrow money, the price goes up. Oh yeah, we, we we've talked about that on the show significantly. One thing that people. I think more and more people are understanding this, but the way that the banking system works is when you get a loan, you actually didn't get lent any money. They just created out of nothing. That's just the, the way that the system works. Well, particularly for something like assets, houses, RVs, I mean, even credit cards could, could fall under this category. You're creating more money for, I, I mean, it's it's not a it's not a, a, a fixed amount of goods, but I mean, roughly speaking, it's a fixed amount of goods that the, the number of houses is not going up at the same speed that the number of loans are going up. So you got more and more money swashing around the system, bidding up the, the similar amount of goods. This is completely different from creating money to say, okay, well, I, I, we'll, and this isn't addressing the user question. We're going to create money to produce more goods or to produce more services. So yes, I, I completely agree as part of the reason prices are driving up is if you have more money lending, it creates more money in the system which is more money chasing around fewer and fewer assets. Yeah, but it's it also is a burden on the system because everybody has to pay off debt. Mm-hmm. And once you have debt, so I just saw some uh, little YouTube video. There's like a trillion dollars worth of automobile loans out there. And what that does, in effect, is drive down the price of the automobile, drives down the price of the automobile because the people are spending so much on debt. And because it drives down the price, you don't get, if you have the car, you just devalue, your car has been devalued because of usury. And this is spreading throughout the entire economy. And there's no end in sight. This may be what we're experiencing right now. This may be like this incredible predatory computer internet operation where it's a combination of government and big 
uh, big tech spying on you to enslave you, your passions, all this other type of stuff. Maybe it's because they fear that uh, it's going to go bust. And it is going to go bust because uh, the American empire is going to go bust uh, because too many sanctions got put on too many countries and they're wanting to get out from under the dollar as the world's reserve currency. All of this type of stuff is, you know, it's sloshing around out there waiting for some type of catalyzing moment, I think. Anyway, I wish you well in your venture. I hope you make <laughs> a lot of money. I hope you pay your wages, laborers, decent wage and put your money to good use. But, uh, you know, Good luck. That's all I can say. Okay. I I appreciate that. Um, so just to I, – I, I did want to circle around on that conversation. Is there a categorical difference between the loan I got to acquire the business and these guys calling me wanting 279% on <laughs> the, the, the money that they want to loan me? No. No. Actually, one of the mistakes that Belloc made was to make a distinction between productive and non-productive loans. And the libertarians like, I uh, uh, forget the guy's name now, the guy that went to Harvard with my son. Anyway, he jumped on that and uh, said he's wrong. Well, he is wrong. There's no difference between a productive and a non-productive loan. It, 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 it doesn't that category doesn't exist so i think the same thing applies with your there's no distinction between mm -hmm. those two loans okay one one has better rates the other doesn't so that's the only difference well the, i mean and I, I don't want to get bogged down on this topic but the distinction to me was my cash flow to debt service ratio can support comfortably what I've got going on right now. If I get something at 279%, I mean, the, the figure right. is just insane. Like I said, I, I might as well just sign over the business to you if you're going to lend me money <laughs> at, at I that think rate. That's the, I, I think yeah. that's the point of lending you money. Certainly that's what Samuel Ross said in Jews Must Live. That is the point of lending you money mm -hmm. is to get you in a trap so that they can take your assets, your income producing assets. You're lucky. Okay, you're lucky. You're going past the 50th floor. Everything's okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it may not, it may change. And if if it does change to your disadvantage, they will remind you there's no shared risk on a loan and you're going to have to pay back. Pacta sunt servanda. You know, you signed on the dotted line. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the difference. Moving on. I want to talk about Adam Smith a little bit. So I, I oh you I got, got okay, I got we've been doing we're on we've been well, on an hour for and an a half. hour and a half. Uh, normally I just do an hour. If okay. you want to come back and do some some more, I I'd be happy to do that. But I got to get off at this point. Okay, well in that case I appreciate your time, and uh, yeah I I had a I had a bunch more here, but um, well we can do we can do a second interview. I'm fine. I enjoyed our conversation. You obviously thought about the thing. It's much better when people read my books. We have much higher level conversations and you obviously understood a lot, you know, and, and good questions. So I'd be happy to do it again. Excellent. Well, um, this has been Delvin Moore with Irita TV and Dr. E. Michael Jones, which you can find. You got a, you got several websites. What's, what's your favorite one that you like to, to send people uh, to? Culturewars.com. And fidelitypress.org. All of my books are available. The only place you can get books like Baron Metal is to go to this website. That's the only place you can get them. Fidelitypress.org or culturewars.com. And I highly recommend it myself. I learned a ton from reading this book. So thank you again, Dr. Jones. And yes, I would love to have a second conversation. I, I okay. wish you well. I presume you have, what, four more hours of writing to do today? <laughs> 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 I do have right here, Ed. <laughs> okay. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.